I think all of us can relate to the idea of being frustrated when you're given the wrong message. Anybody here ever been given the wrong message and then you got all confused or lost? For example, let me ask, what would you do in this situation? I want you to imagine that you're driving down the road and you pull up and this is the signage that you encounter. Like, what do you do with this? I imagine you would, I I don't know about you, but I would be stuck. I think people would be blowing the horn and if they did, you'd be like, what do you do with this? I I love this one right here. Right lane must right left. Uh, Where where do you go? How how do do you, uh, what do you do in this situation? This one cracks me up. Please try to walk without walking. I'm not even sure how you can manage or even accomplish that. Or how about this one here? Do not enter. Enter only. Again, what do you do? Do you go forward? Do you stop? Do you turn away? What do you do? Or how about this one? Just good luck because this traffic situation is a mess. I don't know about you, but there are times in life when we get all sorts of messages, and they can be mixed messages, and and you can get a little stuck or even a little lost because you were given the wrong directions. And and think about this even in, I mean, forget traffic signs. Imagine what it must be like for somebody to come from another country, to come to Canada, and have to adjust to some of the things we say here in Canada. How about, like, watch your mouth? How do you do that? Do you like use a mirror? Do you use the flip on your phone and you video yourself? Or how about shooting your mouth off? I mean, how do you, like, do bullets come out of your mouth? Or uh, how about here in Canada, it gets so cold, you freeze your tail off? Like, I didn't know Canadians had tails. But now imagine what it's like for somebody to come to church and think about all the things we say in church that might confuse somebody. I remember the first time I came to church, I'm nine years old, somebody got up to say, we're going to pray and would you please kneel as far as possible. And I'm like, well, what are the possibilities? Like, how low can we go? I mean, I'm young, I'm flexible. Or how about this one? Would you please turn over with me in your Bibles? I, I don't know if it's big enough. I can turn over in my bed, but I don't know how to turn over in a... But do you see what I mean? Sometimes... We are given a a message, and if you don't understand what it is, I mean, we kind of chuckle because we understand what these terms and phrases mean. But, But what happens if you are given a very important message, but it's not clear and you don't understand it? You see, these things, these signs might be funny, and these sayings might be funny, and we're having a little fun. But what I take very seriously is when somebody gets into the Word of God, they're reading the Word of God, and and they walk away so confused, they don't know how to be a Christian, they don't know what it means to be a Christian or to have a personal, saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And I've seen it happen. I've been in church, and I've talked about this, where I've, I've listened to people say, well, how do you know that you're saved? How do we know that we can have the assurance of salvation? Um, I can't, again, I can't tell you how often I've, people who were dying or they were ill and they were preparing for their death and they would say, you know, I've been faithful all my life. I hope it's good enough to save me. And the problem is, it's not. And, and, and the, If you're counting on your good behavior to save you, then please go back to our series on grace where we learned that salvation is only through faith in Christ alone. So what what do you do with that when you're a third or fourth or fifth generation Adventist? Apparently there are no sixth generation Adventists. We're still a young enough church that we're only at the fifth generation. But, But what do you do when one of your pastor colleagues comes up to you and says, uh, Bob, I- I've been pastoring more years than I can remember, and I don't know that I have a personal relationship with Jesus. I- I'm not sure I know what that looks like. And, and I relate to that. I-, I actually do relate to that because I'm a third-generation Adventist. Uh, my grandmother got saved, raised my dad in the faith, dad left, we came back, and I was introduced to the Advent message when I was nine years of age. And my brain lit up. I mean, I fell in love with Adventism, the Bible, and Bible truth. Loved the Sabbath. 
Love the soon return of Jesus Christ, the three angels message, and I loved Bible prophecy. I mean, I was into this. So much so that by the age of 10, I could give you a Bible study. Now let me tell you what we did on Sabbath afternoons when I was a kid and I was 10 years of age. Anybody here ever go get into marking your Bible? Where you would start out with a Bible topic and you would write it down and you would at the front of your Bible. Um, and, and I don't know, guys, if you can zoom in and get this. And here are a list of Bible subjects. I'm just going to show it to you over here so you can verify. Look at all the Bible topics that are in my Bible. This is 1974. I'm 10 years old, and my dad sits down with me on Sabbath afternoons, and we mark our Bibles. Can you still see the uh, pencil crayon colors that are in my Bible? This is what we did when I was a kid growing up in the church. And, and so we would mark a text and we say the Sabbath, so go to Exodus 20 verses. And then when you get to Exodus 20 and it's verses 8 through 11 on the Sabbath, beneath that would be the next verse that took you to the next passage. I could give you a full-blown Bible study on the Sabbath when I was 10 years of age. By the time I'm 13, like other kids in my church, I understood the 28 fundamental beliefs as well as any adult. So when people come up to me and say, well, pastor, I know my Bible, I kind of smile and I say to myself, yeah, I have since I was 10. And there are a lot of people out there who have Bibles that look exactly like my 10-year-old Bible. And so here I am, I'm 10, I'm 13, I'm growing up in the church, and I'm a good Adventist. I am a good Adventist kid. My parents will tell you that when we, I, we got saved and I got baptized, they had very little problems with me. I was a good Adventist kid, faithful to what we believe, kept all the standards. I was a good Adventist. Kind of like Paul, I was a good Pharisee. Huh? I was a good Adventist. He was a good Jew. I'm a good Sevi. And then imagine my surprise and I'm maybe 19, 20 years of age, and I'm at Berman University. It was Canadian Union College when I went there, but now it's Berman University. We're having a week of prayer, and the speaker that week was a man by the name of Tim Culver, and Tim Culver was an ex-con who'd been in jail, uh, you know, hung out with all the hardened criminals, got saved, and this man was in love with Jesus. I mean, you could tell he had a full-blown, passionate relationship with Jesus, and he kind of reminded me of my dad, who also had been had spent time in prison, got saved, and man, he loved Jesus. And I realized that what Tim Culver and my dad had was a passionate love relationship with the Lord. Those who are forgiven much, they love much. But I realized that as good a Seventh-day Adventist as I was, knowing the doctrines, knowing the truth, being raised up in it, I didn't have what Tim Culver and my dad had, which was a passionate love relationship with Jesus. And I felt it that week. I mean, it, it became like an ache, like a hunger, like there was just something missing in my soul. And so I went up to Tim Culver. And I said, so, you know, you remind me of my dad. I mean, how do we have, how do you develop this personal, intimate relationship with Jesus that you have? You know what he said to me? He said something to me that you've heard quite a lot. He said, you have to give your heart to Jesus. <laughs> it didn't help. I mean, I understood it didn't mean that I come to church, take my heart out, and put it in an offering plate. I mean, that would have scared the deacons. We know that's not what it meant, but it didn't tell me how to have a personal relationship with Christ. So here I am. I'm on an Adventist University campus, and we've got one of, you know, it was a good theology program, and, and I'm thinking, I'm going to go ask one of my theo professors, what does it mean to give your heart to Jesus? I mean, he's a theologian. He studies the Bible professionally for a living. He teaches the Word of God to pastors he's got to know right so I walked into his office and I said hey listen can you tell me what does it mean to give your heart to Jesus and he said you got to surrender it all 
I'm like, I didn't know we were at war. I mean, does that mean I got to put my hands up and say I give up? And he smiled and he laughed and he said, well, yeah, it's kind of like that. And it didn't help me. Uh, and so I went to another professor and I asked, so what does it mean to, you know, surrender it all to Jesus? And he said, you got to lay it all on the altar. And, and then another professor told me, well, you got to fall on the rock and be broken. And then I asked, so how do you fall on the rock? And he said, you got to do it with the eye of faith. I had no idea after all of those sayings, and some of you are laughing because you've heard these sayings too, they didn't help me. And the reason they didn't help me is because they are metaphors, not how-tos. Nobody told me actually how to have a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus. I couldn't do it through metaphors. So you know what I did? I stopped witnessing. I stopped sharing my faith because I realized I couldn't give away what I didn't have. And I knew it. And, and, and in that moment, I, I lost my assurance of salvation. And I didn't know how to be saved because I didn't know how to have a relationship with Jesus. I had a great relationship with Bible truth and Adventism, which pointed Jesus, but I wasn't given the tools to build a relationship with Jesus. So I stopped witnessing. And I made the decision that I was going to be the best Adventist I could, and so that if God could find me faithful, he will say to me, well done, good and faithful servant, well you get saved. That's what I was hoping for. And then I encountered a group of people who were teaching perfection of character theology. And, and, and I thought, this is it. This is my answer. I, I don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, but if I can perfect my character, I can at least show God I'm serious about salvation and our religion, and if I can get all the do's and don'ts down perfectly, he's got to let me in, right? Because look, I'm serious. I'm sincere. I want to be faithful. How can that not be salvation? And then something went horribly wrong. For the first time in my life, my sin increased. I had more problems with sin. The more perfect and obedient to the law I tried to become, the worse a sinner I became. And not only to me. That year, and over the next three years, it wiped out 80% of the theology department at Berman University. 80% of my fellow classmates did not survive that doctrine and they did not stay in the truth because no matter how hard, how much we wanted to be perfectly obedient, the more we did, the deeper and the darker the sin we fell into. Sins I didn't have a problem with before. And was the problem the law? I'm going to get into this in a moment. Was the problem me? No, the problem was I didn't understand salvation and what it meant to have a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus. And I'm not the only one. Andrews University did a study that spanned more than a decade. And they would ask students year after year after year this one question, what does it mean to be a Christian? And so they did this study And 98% of the students responded with, what does it mean to be a Christian? Here's what they said. A Christian is a person who is good, who doesn't cheat, who helps those in need, who does the right thing, who keeps the commandments. In other words, their Christianity was defined by what you did and did not do. Only 2% defined Christianity as a personal, intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you think that that's a youth problem, think again. Barna conducted the same study with adults in the Adventist church. I love the Barna group. They also did this with other churches. And here's what they discovered. 95% of Seventh-day Adventists define a good Christian to be 
one who's good, doesn't cheat, helps those in need, does the right things, and specifically, a good Christian means you keep the commandments. And then we wonder, and only 5% of adults understood that Christianity is actually a loving, intimate, personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so make no wonder our youth leave the church because they're not leaving a relationship, they're just leaving information. You see, most of us will not leave a loving, intimate relationship. What most of us leave is information, doctrine. And so make no wonder our kids leave the church. And so the question I got to ask here this morning is this, are we saved through our do's and don'ts? Because here's the bad news. If you define Christianity as being a kind, caring, morally decent human being, which is what keeping the commandments is, if that's how you define Christianity, then guess what? There are a lot of people out there who are Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims and Jews and atheists, and they are good, kind, caring, moral, decent people. And that does not mean they are saved. As a matter of fact, you all know what I'm about to say is true. Some of the meanest, nastiest, most abusive people you've met actually go by the name Christian and even Adventist. Do's and don'ts, being good, being kind, being moral, being obedient to a set of laws does not save us. So if I were to ask you, if 10-year-old me were to ask you, well, how do we get saved? I would open my Bible, and, and I would go, okay, the assurance of salvation. And I would say, please take your Bible and turn with me to, and you know what I've been doing it? I've been doing this since I was 10. Please take your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 3 and verse 20. Look at this. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands the law simply shows us how sinful we are. Here's what the word of God is saying to us today. This is what Paul is saying. The law was never designed to save you or make you holy. It cannot do that. Look at what it says. No one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. So how do we get right with God? We get right with God in verse 22. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who you are. In other words, salvation is for everybody or it is for nobody. You've heard me say it. This is where I get it from. So what does it mean to be made right with God? This is an important question in salvation. To be made right with God, and folks, this is salvation. This should be the only definition of salvation we're ever allowed to use in the Seventh-day Adventist church. And that is the forgiveness and the removal of our sin, so much so that God gifts you his righteousness, his holiness, and his innocence. That's what it means to be right with God. That's what it means to be saved. Oh, this, this is going to get better here this morning. Now, if you were a part of the Sabbath school lesson this morning, you're going to recognize these verses. Galatians 2.16. Yet we know that a person is made right with God. They've been forgiven. They've been redeemed. They've been made holy and righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. Not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ. Not because we have obeyed the law, for no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. In other words, the law was not designed to make you holy or righteous. The commandments cannot forgive your sin, remove your sin, or make you holy and innocent that only comes through an intimate, personal relationship by faith in Jesus Christ. We are saved by grace, through faith, because of Christ alone. Now, this is from the Sabbath school lesson this morning. And by the way, I love how the Holy Spirit works. Because I wrote this a year ago. I, I wrote this a year ago, and yet it lands on the very Sabbath. We're learning about this in Sabbath school. Look at this. 
But those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. For the scriptures say, cursed is everyone who does not obey, observe and obey all the commands that are written in God's book of the law. So it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. For the scripture says, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Do you hear the words? The just live by faith. This way of faith is very different from the way of the law, which says it is through obeying the law that a person has life. Now, if that passage was a little confusing for you, it was for me at first. Because when I first read this, I'm like, what does it mean to be under a curse because I'm keeping the law? I mean, think about this. Seventh-day Adventists are our claim to fame, if I can use the word fame. Our claim is that God's end-time people will be those who have the patience and the testimony of Jesus, and they are the ones who keep the commandments of God. Here are they who keep the commandments of God, and yet it says that those who are keeping, they're under a curse? How do you understand this passage? And here's what the passage is getting at. Back in Jesus' day, they taught that it is through obeying the law that a person has life. In other words, if you want to be saved, you had to perfectly keep all the commandments of God, and that included 613 rules. And, and they had a problem. Nobody was keeping the rules. Not perfectly. I mean, they taught if they could keep all the commandments and all the laws perfectly for just one day, if we could just get the whole nation obeying God for one day, Messiah would come. And it didn't happen. And so they said the problem is we need rules to keep, to protect the rules. And if you keep these rules, you won't break those rules. So 613 more rules to protect the rules. And it didn't work. So they needed rules to protect the rules that protected the commandment rules. And that didn't work. So now we got more rules for rules for rules. And Jesus said, you buried people under rules. So much so, if somebody were converted into Judaism, you'd make them twice the son of hell they were before they met you guys. So how is it that you... Pursue a life of commandment keeping and it says you're under a curse. Only if your commandment keeping is your attempt at proving to God you're worth saving. If you're looking to the law and to the commandments like I did, faithful obedience. Can we be honest? For a lot of Seventh-day Adventists and a lot of Protestant Christians, your backup plan to salvation is your faithful obedience. You're counting on your commandment keeping to cover you just in case grace wasn't enough to save you. That's what I did, and I know I'm not alone in this. And so here you are, trusting in laws and rules and standards, your faithfulness to commandments to save you, and the Bible says you're under a curse because you already broke the law. Too late, game over, you're under condemnation, and now you're headed for death. A law you broke can't save you, it can only condemn you. This is why the Bible says you're under a curse if you think the law and obedience is salvation. Because you already broke the law. One of my Bible texts on sin, Romans 6.23. For all of sinned and you know, uh, we, we've got all well, of sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and we've got, you know, um, 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 he who says he is without sin is a liar and there's no light in them. All have sinned. Scripture says we know everybody sinned because everybody dies. We've all sinned. We've all broken the law too late. It can't save you. It can only say, sorry, you're under the law of sin and death now. Uh, the soul that sins, it dies, and I can only condemn you to death. Don't look to the law to save you because it can't. It wasn't designed to do that. Grace was. Ephesians 2.8 For by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. 
It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, the do's and the don'ts, so that no one may boast. This has to be a gift because you've already broken the law, you've already sinned, you're already under condemnation. There's nothing you can do to make this right, so God has to gift to you what you cannot fix. I love this right here. Titus 3 and 5. He saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, the do's and the don'ts. Do you know why your righteous deeds, your do's and your don'ts cannot save you? Because scripture's clear on this, because of sin and our sinful nature, our righteousness, our perfect obedience to the law still amounts to filthy rags. I mean, imagine coming to the judgment and saying to God, God, I am fit to save because here's my righteousness and what you're giving God is your dirty laundry. And and, and God's like, you think that can save you? I'm gifting you the perfect robes of Jesus and you're giving me your dirty underwear. Because that's what your perfection amounts to. It's filthy rags. So the question I want to ask this morning is this, true or false, salvation is not a reward for good behavior. True or false? True. It's true. Your salvation is not a reward for good behavior. Look at this. Ephesians 1 and 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. Not by my good deeds, not by my obedience, not by my faithfulness or my filthy rags, perfect righteousness, but I'm washed clean because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Look at this, Romans 3.24 being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Here's my point. So many of us for too long have thought and have lived as if our faithful obedience was the key to our salvation, as if somehow our commandment keeping was our ticket to heaven. And the word of God is clear on this today that the only way you're getting to heaven is through a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, your salvation happened in an instant. It happened the moment you believed. You you saw the cross of Christ and, and, and you saw what was wrong with your sin. You saw the love of Jesus Christ hanging on a cross. You confessed your sin. You repented of your sin. And in that moment, Jesus Christ made you the holiness and righteousness of God. And it happened in an instant. And you are saved. But now I cannot tell you how often I've had somebody come up to me and say, Yes, Pastor Bob, I know that we are saved by faith, but. Now, I got a problem with the word but. I don't see it in the word of God. Uh, Being justified is a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, but. There's no but. Anytime you are told in scripture that you are saved by faith, it is not followed by a but works continuation. It's not there. Cover to cover, nowhere does it ever say you're saved by faith, but. Oh, but Pastor Bob, come on. How do you know somebody actually is a real Christian that you were truly converted without the works because faith without works is dead? How do you know they're truly saved if they don't act the do's and the proper don'ts? Here's where we kind of get this wrong. At least I did. Salvation is not faith plus works. Salvation is faith and faith alone in Christ Jesus. That is salvation. And, and, that's, and it happens in an instant. In the instant you believe and put your faith in Christ's grace and ability to save you, in that heartbeat, twinkling of an eye, instant, you are saved. So what does it mean to be a Christian? Well, here's the thing. The day I got saved, I got called. 
You don't get saved without getting called. This is not a but statement. You are saved, and the saved are called, which is why we are told we have this high calling in Christ Jesus. And the calling is to be like Jesus, and that calling doesn't save you. It is for the saved. No salvation, no calling. And the calling is the calling of transformation that is the work of a lifetime. And so I spend the rest of my saved life learning how to be like Jesus. And there are days I get it wrong. I don't think I'm the only one who gets it wrong some days. I don't think I'm the only, you know, slip and fall Christian in the house. What makes me a Christian, hear me today, what makes me a Christian is my strong desire to become a fully devoted follower of Jesus whereby I obey Christ, I follow Christ, and I live out his teachings in my life. That's what makes me a Christian. It doesn't make me saved. I first got saved, then I got called to be like Jesus. The one happened in an instant, the other is the process of a lifetime. And the process doesn't replace the instant. Salvation is not a program. It is not a process. It is a gift that is given instantly upon the moment you receive it through faith in Christ. And now you are called to be more than you were before God saved you. It is the upward calling in Christ Jesus. What makes me a Christian? I am committed to becoming a fully devoted follower of Jesus. What saves me is my faith in Jesus. Somebody out there, type amen in the comments, would you please? This is your salvation. It's a gift. I don't have to work for it or jump for it. My stepdaughter, Amalia, when we talk about this around the kitchen table, she doesn't say a word. She just goes... And we know you don't have to roll for it. You can hear her laughing right now. She got it. You don't have to roll for this salvation work. You don't have to prove yourself worthy of it because you weren't. You weren't perfect. You weren't holy. You weren't righteous. But you were loved. You got it because you were loved by God who said, I'm determined to save you. Your sin didn't change your value. My love maintained your value right up into the cross. And now he says, will you be my friend? Because the invitation, can we be friends, is the upward calling where God is saying, would you follow me and be like me? I love you so much, I don't want to leave you the way you were. I want you to be like me. And it only happens through a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus. Here's where I got it from. John 17, 3. This is eternal life. This is how you get the gift of eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Do you know? Do you know Jesus? I don't mean have you heard about him, and I don't mean have you been talking about him and reading about him. I mean, do you know him? I'm reminded of a story about a woman who was driving down the road one day, and she got pulled over by the police for speeding. Police officer, of course, knocks on the window and says, okay, I need to see your driver's license. Pulls the driver's license out of her purse, hands it to the police officer. He looks at it, looks at the woman, looks back at the license, and he says, it says here, You're supposed to be wearing glasses. And the woman looked at him and said, no, 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 it's okay, I have contacts. To which the police officer said, I don't care who you know, put your glasses back on. Now, when it comes to salvation, it's not who you know, it's who knows you. Because you see, Jesus needs to know you if you want to have eternal life. And I discovered that that night as I was listening to Tim Culver talk about how Jesus saved him. It's not who you know, it's who knows you. And the question is, does Jesus know you? Now again, where do I get this from? Well, look at this. In Matthew 7 and 23, it's the sheep and the goats. And Jesus says to the lost, 
Depart from me, I never knew you. In 25, 12, go away, I don't know you, to the foolish virgins. It says in Luke 13, the enter the gate story. Depart from me, I don't know you. What was the condition for being lost? What is the basis? According to Jesus Christ, your Lord, your Savior, Savior, the King to come, the Judge to come, what's the condition for being lost? Jesus didn't know you. And you see, all of these people in these stories go back and read the stories. Every single one of them claimed to know Jesus. Jesus said, there's a problem here. I don't know you. Let's go back to John 17, 3. I want to talk about that word no. Let's talk about how to have a personal relationship, intimate relationship with Jesus. And I'm not going to tell you to fall on rocks or to have the eye of faith or to, you know, lay it all on the altar. We're going to get a little more practical here today. Look at this again. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. If you're a note taker, you're writing notes, maybe mental or on paper. You see that word for no? It's the Greek word, uh, jikonosis. And it's a very specific word. It isn't just a knowledge word, I know it. This is a very personal and intimate word in scripture. Because this is the word the Bible used when it said Joseph didn't know Mary Gnosico. He didn't gnosico marry until after Jesus was born. Maybe you're still not getting it. it. It's what the Bible means when it says Adam gnosicoed Eve. He knew Eve and she bore a son, Seth. It's, it's this idea of Abraham gnosicoed. He knew Sarah and they had a son and his name was Isaac. And it's much more than these adult transactions. You know what I'm saying? It means more than that. It means a personal, intimate, emotional bond. I am bonded to you. I know you at the emotional, bonded, relational level. God, God, I want them to know you. Can no go you? The same way Adam can no go to Eve. Abraham, Sarah. Father, the same way I gnosico, I know you at the personal, emotional, intimate level. Those who have the Son at that level, you have the assurance of eternal life. So how do you get to know God at this level? And here's the thing. I didn't know it, but I already knew Nobody told me I actually knew how to do this because I've been doing it all my life. I just didn't know I could do the same thing with God. Do you have a personal friend? I mean, somebody you call your bro, your buddy, your friend. You can also code them. Uh, do you have a BFF? Do you have a best friend forever because you know them Gnosico? If you're married, you definitely have Gnosico, or at least I hope you do. And if you don't, we can provide some help for you this fall. I'll get into that later. How do you gnosico Jesus? I do it the same way I came to gnosico my wife. Now, you all know I'm crazy about my wife. I talk about her almost as much as I talk about Jesus. Jesus is now my first love. And she is my only earthly love. I love this woman. And, and I tell you, when I first met her, we weren't gnosicoed. We weren't in love. I, I met my wife, and I thought she was cool because she was a bit of a sci-fi geek like myself. She liked what I liked, and I thought, hey, she's pretty cool. I, I, I like that. And, and so we were, had a friendship, just friends, friendly people who knew each other. And then we had a mutual set of friends who were in trouble. And so we talked about our friends. And then we began to talk about other things. And I started to gnosico. Ba'at the Bedich. And and the more I got to know her, the the more time, I was just like, wow, I really like this woman. Until one day I moved from I like you to, well, I'm attracted to you. And and, and so I wanted to spend more time with her. 
So it started with a, a flurry of texts. And I, I, she'd work at night and I'd text her to keep her company and, and, and our relationship was growing and I think I fell in love with her first. And I remember one night I texted her and we were laughing and joking and offhandedly I just laughingly said, I love you. And she sent me back a thumbs up. <laughs> I was like, I got some work to do. But we grew closer together. And so we talked. And you know what I discovered? My, this woman had a will and she had a way. She does. I'm not saying she's stubborn. She's here, I won't say that in public. But no, I'm, I'm saying she had a will and a way. And what I mean by that is there are things, hon, you value. There are things you cherish. There are things you care about. There are things that are important to you. And what I discovered is what became important to her became important to me. I began to care about what she cared about, and I began to love those she loved. And, and here's the funny thing. She began to love the things I loved. And, and, and she cared about what I cared about, and she began to value what I valued. We began to conosico. We started to become one in our will and our way because of a relationship of love and respect and care. And the same is true of Jesus Christ. It works like any other relationship. So how do you get to know Jesus? And Jesus said, you search the scriptures looking for salvation, but everything in here points to me. This is me. This is the revel. The book of Revelation begins with the revelation of Jesus Christ. So when you get into the word, it's important, I get it, to do Bible studies. My, my studies on doctrines and, and truth it, that was important. But what was more important is I should have been asking the question, what did the state of the dead tell me about Jesus? Prayer, what does it tell me about God? Uh, where are the dead? Ecclesiastes 12, 7. What did that tell me about people resting rather than going to hell? What did that tell me about God? The Sabbath rest, um, the, the second coming. Um, heaven is a real place. When you get into the Word of God, and right now, if you're not sure you have a loving, intimate relationship with Jesus, I want you to stop doing Bible studies for a while. And I want you to engage in one study only for a while, just until you get this right. I want you to get into the Word every day and say, God, as I read the Word, would you tell me who you are? Because everything, it's all about Jesus. That's what I mean when I say it's all about him. This book is all about him and he wants you to know him. He wants you to know he furiously loves you. Your sin didn't change your value. He's determined to save you and he asks the ultimate question, can we be friends? And until you find the answer to that question in the word, there's no other study. There's nothing else you should be considering but Christ and him crucified and his invitation to be saved. It's the only study. It is the greatest study. Here's, here's what Isaiah says about those who just focus on the do's and the don'ts and the study without God. Look how serious this is. And so says the Lord, Isaiah 29, 13. And so says the Lord, these people say they are mine. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And their worship of me is nothing but man-made rules learned by rote. They know the rules. They keep the standards. They know the doctrine. They do and they do. They have the truth. But they don't have a clue as to who I am. And because they don't know who I am, they don't know how to worship me. The only study, the most important study, is God and who he is, God's salvation and his love for you. Everything else needs to be seen in the light that streams from the cross. Sister White got this right. Do you know Jesus? Do you, Gnosico, have a real, intimate, personal relationship with Christ? 
Because that's the invitation through this series, Can We Be Friends? And so as I close here today, I have a prayer for you. And it's found in Scripture. It was actually read in Sabbath school today. I love how the Holy Spirit works. Oh, look at this, by the way, before I get into that. Look at what Sister White has to say about a religion without knowing Jesus. The greatest deception of the human mind in Christ's day was that mere assent to the truth constitutes righteousness. In all human experience, a theoretical knowledge of the truth has proven to be insufficient for the saving of the soul. Many take it for granted that they are Christians simply because they subscribe to certain theological tenets. We know the truth. Men may profess faith in the truth, but sinful men can become righteous only as they have faith in God and maintain a vital connection, relationship. Can we be friends with him? It's not enough to have a relationship with doctrine and truth and to have your faithful do's and don'ts. It doesn't save. The only thing that saves you is a gnosiko relationship with Jesus Christ. So now here's my prayer for you. For I am determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So much so that I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you. What do we do at this church? What do we do here at Nepean? What, what is our mission? To empower both saints and seekers to become fully gnosikoed followers of Jesus Christ. He will empower you with inner strength through his spirit that Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand as all God's people should how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience, gnosiko, the love of Christ. Though it is too great to understand fully, got to be looking at it throughout eternity, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. How are we saved? Through a personal, intimate, loving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And through His Word, God still speaks. And the one thing he is asking you today is can we be friends? Can I gnosico you and will you gnosico me? So much so that the roots of your life will go deep into his love. How do you respond? How do you respond to the invitation can we be friends? I don't know about you, but for me and my house, we choose the Lord.